Good afternoon, hello, welcome to this very exciting live and interactive session from Two Degrees. I'm Tom Idle and I'm going to be your host here for the next 45 minutes or so as we get stuck into what promises to be a fascinating conversation. Our subject today, corporate NGO charity partnerships. Now, not so long ago, a lot of companies looked at these types of partnerships purely as a way to generate some positive PR and to generally feel good about themselves. And thankfully, those days are, are coming to an end, I say with hesitation, but similarly, you have uh, NGOs and charities that are no longer purely interested in, in partnering up to access uh, large resources. And what we have instead, increasingly, are two parties that are looking to drive lasting value from relationships that set out common goals to boost social, environmental, and economic performance. And if you look at the results of the latest CNE Corporate NGO Partnerships Barometer, when corporates are asked about their primary reasons for wanting to partner with an NGO or a charity, yes, the reasons are about enhancing reputation and credibility, but they're also increasingly citing long-term stability, the ability to innovate, and a need to develop their people as reasons for partnerships. And the NGOs and the charities do want to access resources, uh, but 73% of them actually say that drawing on a wider pool of good people is important. And two thirds said that it was about building reputation and credibility of their own organizations. Um, and for me, I think the most in interesting finding from the latest study is the perceived value that partnerships can actually bring. Uh, the overwhelming majority, uh, some 87% of corporates, say that maintaining an NGO charity partnership has helped their business better understand social environmental issues. But crucially, almost 60% of them said that these partnerships have helped their companies actually change their practices for the better. And that's a figure that's actually jumped 14% year on year since CNE started doing that survey around five years ago. So there's certainly business value to be garnered from partnerships, but establishing, maintaining, you know, these good relationships is actually easier said than done. And we're going to explore some of the challenges uh, today as part of this session. And I'm keen to use the next 45 minutes or so to find out more about how effective partnerships actually work and what the secret is to enduring success and how partners actually work towards some common objectives. So, today we're broadcasting to you from inside the uh, rather impressive Sky Campus here in West London, and we're going to hear from a partnership that has been working very well for the last 12 years, uh, and that is a partnership between Sky and the Youth Sport Trust. So, we're going to meet our, our panellists uh, shortly, um, who are, and then we're going to get into a conversation with them. So, first up, we have uh, Judy Hill. Uh, and Judy leads the sports and arts programs within Sky Academy, including the rather successful Sky Sports Living for Sport initiative, which no doubt will be explored in a bit more uh, detail shortly. So welcome, Judy. Thank you. Uh, on the other side of the partnership, uh, we have Ali Oliver, uh, who is the CEO of Youth Sport Trust. Ali has worked in education and sports development for the last 20 years. And as the Interim Chief Exec of Youth Sport Trust, she oversees the strategic direction of the charity, including making sure that projects such as Sky Sports Living for Sport deliver real results. Good Ali, evening. great to have you here. And then finally, we have uh, with us Sean Heathcote, who has been running the Sky Sports Living for Sport program from within Youth Sport Trust. Uh, and Sean has the responsibility for delivering that program across 1,500 secondary schools across the UK and Ireland and dealing with all the mentors that make up that programme make it such a success. So, Sean, welcome. Hi, Tom. So, very shortly, we're going to get into a conversation uh, with these guys, and we're going to find about a bit more about how they actually work together. But really, we want to hear from you, our audience tuning in. This is designed to be uh, an interactive experience. We'd love to hear from you, uh, your questions, your comments. You can make them, uh, firstly, using Twitter. If you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag SkyPartnership. Uh, send us your comments and questions via Twitter or on the platform that you're using to listen to us right now on WebEx. You can use the uh, Q&A box function within that to send us your questions. There is actually another function, the chat box. Uh, if you've got any technical questions, you can't hear us properly or you're having technical dif difficulties, 
Get in touch with us using the, the chat box, but questions please via the Q&A box, and we'll try to get through as many of your questions uh, as possible. So let's start. Let's find out a bit more about this, this partnership between Sky and Youth Sport Trust. Judy, uh, welcome. Why don't you tell us what this partnership is to give us some context? Well, if I first of all tell you about what Sky Sports Living for Sport is and then a little bit about the partnership. Um, Sky Sports Living for Sport is a free initiative and it's open to all secondary schools across the UK and Ireland. And it was launched in 2003. You've referred to how long the partnership's been going and it's been delivered all that time in partnership with Youth Sport Trust. It's not about finding the next sports star. It's all about using sports stars and sports talent and the skills learned through sport to actually inspire young people and develop their confidence and life skills. And we do that um, actually harnessing a team of over 90 athlete mentors who are world-class athletes and their inspirational stories and the work that they do in schools in partnership with Youth Sport Trust actually bring about some real change in young people's lives. And this program is actually part of Sky Academy and that's Sky's commitment to offer one million opportunities to young people by 2020 to build life skills and, and fulfil their potential. Okay. Uh, and, and Ali, um, how did it kind of start in the first place? Who approached who and how did this relationship start? Well, I guess it started in a very different way to the way it has evolved, actually. So it started by a chance meeting of the previous director of the Bigger Picture at Sky and the chair of the Usable Trust. Um, and it arose because of a conversation which identified a common interest in young people achieving their very best in life and sport. So obviously we're the youth sport trust, so it says what it is on the tin, but obviously um, Sky had those interests as well. And from the very first conversation those two individuals had, it was about a shared mission, a sense of common purpose to build a better future for young people or you know try and raise aspirations and ensure that young people achieve their potential. So that started back in 2003. That was when that first sort of conversation happened and the program got going. Um, so it certainly wasn't anyone approaching anyone directly about it, and it wasn't necessarily particularly strategically planned. It was quite organic to begin with. But after a pilot year in 2003, I think what both partners identified was both a shared value set, and yes, we can make something work, but the original idea and the original product that we put to schools wasn't quite right. So we had to immediately mm. get to grips with how working together and maximising our complementary assets can deliver something that would achieve both the organisation's respective objectives. Um, so to cut to the chase, um, you know, we're here now 12 years on, and a, and a couple of things were pretty significant in the evolution of the programme. I think, um, first of all, putting some unique inspiration, which came from the fusion of what Sky do brilliantly and hopefully what the Youth Sport Trust do very well, which was the use of athlete mentors. Mm -hmm. So either current elite athletes or those retiring, using their experience of sport to inspire young people. And then secondly, with some a change in our tack around the use of the brand, actually. Right. And we can talk about that later, but the brand was used very differently through the history of the programme. Okay. And just to add to that, I think from, <coughs> from Sky's perspective, there was always a big push from senior exec to make a broader contribution to society, and it was, it was that right space. Young people made sense. We were a relatively young company in a media sector at that time. Sport was a big part of what Sky was about at that time. So young people in sport was very much a meaningful way for us to deliver social impact. But what YST were looking at is not just getting kids active, it was actually meaningful social impact, which I think was one of the common areas that we shared. Yeah, yeah. And obviously creating value is, is everything here. And, and how do you establish a series of kind of objectives or, or key performance indicators? Uh, what does that process look like? Do you want to start, Judy? Yeah, I can talk about from, from Sky's perspective. I mean, we're obviously a very ambitious company. Uh, we aim to make an impact very quickly, and we, we want to achieve results. And at the same time, they need to be effective and quali you know, quality results. So it's important that whatever we do, we're able to scale our programs quite quickly. So as Ali said, this started quite small with a pilot school, and you, you kind of look at how your success is, and you take your learnings from there. And then for quite a significant amount of years, there was about a 450 core school um, sort, of, sort of population. And then in the last four years, we scaled it up quite quickly to over 1,500 schools across the UK and Ireland. And across that, we have to measure and keep track of results. And we kind of do that in three ways. We have three broad areas of measurement, which is first of all reach. 
We want to maximise the number of young people that we are affecting and that can bring um, this programme to. Obviously, over time, you look at the social impact. And we have a very rigorous third-party research mechanism that gives us that, that measurement and evaluation, and we have sort of evidence and stats to prove that. And the final area is really brand value. We need to look at value as a corporate that delivers back to the brand because, you know, we don't make any apology that we are looking for return on investment, and it, 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 as well as societal. We also have research that proves that if people know and understand our initiatives. They feel warmer about the brand, and that's very important to us too. So in every area, we have measured stats against that. So for instance, if it was reach, it would be what number of schools are taking part, what number of participants have, have you, have you um, been able to impact. With social impact, we have a, a slide um, that actually you might be able to see at the moment, which is all about some of the evidential uh, measurement and evaluation work that we have um, provided. This is actually a view for, brought from teachers, but really when you see the, the, the numbers, which is really only half the story, but when you've got 91% of teachers seeing an improvement in self-confidence and self-esteem, when you've got an 81% improvement in behaviour judged by teachers, we're very proud of these outcomes. Um, but really stats are only half the story. It's about what is the impact on those young people's lives? And we often see very individual journeys that we celebrate actually every year at our Sky Sports Living for Sport Awards, which happened just last week. And when you see the journey that individual students, teachers, and projects have been on, then you know that it's actually working and you're getting a value and a return on your investment. Yeah, yeah. And Ali, for you, I mean, presumably you're measuring the same kind of metrics What's the process for you in terms of agreeing on those objectives from the outset? With, with I, I guess we agree, and we, we have exactly the same three things. So obviously we, we are hugely interested in reach for us, how, how many young people we can reach, how many schools we can um, engage and affect in terms of their practice, what we do, we do. Similarly, the social value, just as the things that Judy's just gone through, they are they are our measures. Is that a coincidence, though, or is this something you've it, commonly agreed? We've commonly agreed yeah. them, and yeah. I think that's where the partnership has worked. So something like, what are the right measures for yeah. us to be looking yeah. at in terms of impact on young people. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the Youth Sport Trust experience and expertise of working with schools for 20 years. We know what's important to schools yeah. and therefore deciding on key performance indicators which give Sky the right social value mm -hmm. measures but also are going to be relevant, meaningful and resonate with schools. So they yeah. want the programme because they know it's going to make a difference to things that are important to them. So I think that's how we've used our respective expertise and viewpoints on the program. Sure, sure. And Sean, perhaps I can bring you in now. I mean, you, you're kind of working at the, the cold face, as it were, of the Sky Sports Living for Sport. What, what's kind of been achieved so far as, as a result of this partnership? Um, the achievements, Tom, really are, are twofold. I think there's the, the development of the actual on-the-ground program and how we've um, developed that, but I think also the impact and the reach of, of the results. So in terms of that, we, we've talked very much about how the strategies of both agencies are built hardcore into this program. But I think we can bring a visual up that we can show about just where we always refer back to the unique selling points of the organisations. And this has been as important for us over the length of time of the program. So in terms of the Youth Sport Trust, we bring that reach in schools, a credibility in school sport, and an expertise in school sport, and that's the bit we always focus back on when we're looking at delivering, and we link that into Sky Sports, bring in the reach into the community, what's a very engaging brand for young people, obviously investment, and the access to inspiring sport and talent. And I think when you bring those two together, as Judy's referenced earlier, we started with a very small pilot, and, and very specifically started with that as we wanted to understand the need for this work from the consumer, which are the schools and the teachers for us. We wanted to understand if we got the right piece of work and how we could develop that to have the most impact on the young people, which is what our key aim is. And I think starting from 40 schools in just England and growing over a 12-year period to now over 1,500 schools every year taking part in the UK and Ireland, we, as Julie said, had a course of 400, 450 visits a year, even in 2010. Where we're at now with the growth and reach is we've got over 3,000 athlete mentor visits happening in schools every right. single year. And a team of what was when I joined in 2010, just over a dozen athletes, we've now got, next year will be over 100 athlete mentors. Yeah. So what we've achieved in um, so far with the programme is the growth and the reach has allowed us to have some amazing impact on young people. Yeah, and some of these athletes are fairly famous stars, aren't they? 
Yeah, we have, we have two ways that we use that, Tom. We, we sort of have the ambassadors for the programme, which, for want of a better phrase, we might call the headline sports people. So we're talking about people like Johnny Wilkinson, David Beckham, Jessica Ennis-Hill, um, Thierry Henry. And, and those are the people that we really use to inspire young people when they look at this programme, what they've achieved, sort of global superstars, really. Yeah. But, but what's key and fundamental to this program are the athlete mentors that go in and do the day-to-day -day work on the program. These are all elite athletes. They've achieved at an elite level on the world stage in a whole range of sports. Probably not the household names, but all of them have got a very unique and specific journey that they can tell yeah. about how they've had both successes but also challenges mm -hmm. and how they've had to overcome barriers in their journeys. Yeah. And that's the real key piece that we talk to the young people about because as Julie said this program is not just about sport it's about the skills you learn through sport and how you use them in everyday life sure. so we really get those elite athlete mentors who the children look up in awe at to, to explain how they've been on some very challenging journeys and help young people understand how to embark on their own journeys yeah 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 so when it comes to the actual measurement of the kind of social impact and the value of, of this partnership this program what are the sort of nuts and bolts? How do you actually do it? Because a lot of it's anecdotal, isn't it? That where you see a, see a child that, that has come over, come over a, a particular challenge in his in his school life or yeah. or something. How do you actually get to the heart of, of measure, measurement? I guess. Well, what I was talking about earlier when I said individual journeys, I mean it, it's it's not anecdotal because we actually have an employed independent research company, Chrysalis, who were actually jointly um, commissioned by YST and ourselves to actually look at measuring social value, not only from the teacher's perspective, but actually what impact it's had on the individual. Mm -hmm. So it'll be questions like, there are, there are skills that we measure, that we look for in confidence and teamwork and communication, and across the piece you need to understand, and we have results on what that has impacted by taking part in the programme, have mm -hmm. they improved and how much have they improved. So it's actually statistically evidential. The stories we're talking about are, are the, the sort of qualitative times when, again, referring back to the award, it's a point in time where we reach out into all the schools who've actually been taking part and participating, and we say, you know, have you got a shining example of how this has impacted on you? You know, and there's various criteria and questions about what has that led to, what has this person achieved, where did they come from, and it is certainly not about sporting ability in the slightest. It will sometimes be about a child who's been bullied, who's found their confidence again to put their hand up in class. It can be someone actually like one of our winners, Emma, this year, who was a, a, an absolutely brilliant straight-A student, hit her teenage years, found the challenge of actually academic life, the, the pressures of a, a sporting, she was quite good at swimming, sporting success, all sort of crashed down around her and she really felt in a bad place. And then she used Sky Sports in Sport to find her way. And all of these are not evidenced as such, but we go and meet these people, we, we film them, they tell their stories. and. If you like, it, there's nothing more authentic than a young person saying that this couldn't have happened without the Sky Talks and Sport. They are the moments that make us that make us do the work we do, really, aren't they? Emotionally Sorry, I know. I was still emotional about last week, actually. Yeah. yeah. So it's not all stats. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think this is probably slightly um, again on the on the line of be, being able to look at the. Um, lives of athletes. So I think one of the things we must never forget in this programme is it's absolutely about changing the lives of young people. Mm. But Sky Sport Looking for Sport was the first programme to really start to um, enable athletes, particularly those towards the end of their career, transition mm. themselves into life after sport. And where where the whole concept of athlete mentoring came from um, was the Youth Sport Trust working with a retired athlete, Gwyn Batten, who was a, an Olympic rower, our first British um, woman to run, win a, a medal at an Olympic Games from Sydney. Um, and what she wanted to do was make sure that all of those skills that Sean talked about didn't get lost. The minute she retired, all of that work in that journey didn't get lost. It got handed on and there was a legacy to that work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think is a value of this programme is the role it's played in a little bit of thought leadership across the system. Mm -hmm. So we now see athlete mentors in many other um, organisations and guises doing not as good a work as Sky Sport Living for Sport does perhaps, <laughs> or no, just slightly different work, mm -hmm. but it's really important that the value of the programme and its wider impact on young people is, is recognised, I think. Sure. So the social value is one thing. What about the, the business value of a partnership like this to Sky? Do you measure that, and, and how do you measure that? Well, we basically have um, 
the measurements across Sky Academy that are common to all. So I've talked about the fact that Sky Sports Swimming Sports sits within Sky Academy. Mm -hmm. And there are five initiatives across that. And the business value that we have is that we've set our aim to give one million opportunities to young people by 2020. And we are actually measuring every participant and the effect it has on them. So we know that that's important. And the business value to us, I think I said earlier, is back to the sort of power of the value that brings back to the brand. Yeah. Um, it isn't why we do it, because it's, it's not, that's not the case at all, but we have the research that we can't come back to the business and keep doing activity that doesn't actually make a difference yeah. or actually make a, bring a, a value back to the brand. And we research on a tracker on a quarterly basis amongst consumers, opinion formers, um, prospective customers. You know, what are you thinking about Sky? Are you aware of such and such initiative? And we consistently get a warm feeling towards Sky, a better view of, of us as a corporate when they know and understand what we're investing. And I yeah. guess that's that's a that's a business benefit, if you like, sure. but it's not the reason to do it. No, and then it, that, to do that and that enhanced brand presumably leads to to more sales. Well, we we don't have a direct correlation, but one would obviously say that customers who feel better about Sky are more likely to yeah, yeah. want sure. to be part sure. of our, our and, customer base. And so, why do you think that this partnership works so well? What is it? What's great about working with Sky, Ali? Um, lots of things. So probably the best thing about working with Sky for us, the Usable Trust, is the um, moral purpose and the integrity behind the program. So this never was, as I described earlier, something that either party brought to the other, and, mm -hmm. and it would be, you know the interest came from one side. It was organic, jointly developed out of this common belief that there, there is a way to build a brighter future for mm -hmm. young people, and the power of sport can make a huge contribution to that. And that's that has been the touchstone as the program has evolved and probably that's the other great thing about the Sky Sport Living for Sport program is it has evolved. It mm. changes every year and that evolution keeps it fresh. It makes sure that it responds to changes in the context. So you know education changes a lot and policy changes a lot and school priorities change a lot and what Sky has been magnificent doing is working with us to evolve the program equally. They set the bar high and challenged us to be more innovative and how can we be more creative to ensure that the, the program resonates in terms of their ambitions. So the best thing about working together is it is a partnership. And what does that demand, that constant need to, to change and evolve together like any good relationship? What, what does it demand? Of, is it about trust? Is it about, I don't know, something else? I think it is about trust, and I think what we were able to do in the early years, one of the important things about p the piloting of the programme and growing it gradually was we were able to prove that the programme worked mm. and prove certainly as a delivery partner on the behalf of the Youth Sport Trust that we could deliver mm. this guy and that they could trust us and, and believe that we were the right partner to, to choose to work with. I think beyond that, um, I'm probably, we've probably all got various things to offer, but the continuity of contact and the openness and fluidity of the relationship, um, courageous conversations have been had about, you know, when we've hit times when, you know, you will in a relationship hit times mm -hmm. when you, you need to negotiate, you need to compromise. It's that willingness to do that. Okay, sure. Yeah, just to come in on that, Tom, I mean, for me, it's a very simple one about the best thing about working with Sky. For me, the constant challenge that we get through the programme, and Ali's talked about, we're always raising the bar, and Sky are always raising the bar of what next, where can we develop next, yeah. and sometimes that could be seen as a real challenge, yeah. and, and sometimes maybe a negative, but for me, it, it's done in such a positive way, so that constant challenge, but there's a respect for the individual, so certainly as me as the programme manager on the ground delivering the programme. I always feel that my my expertise in my knowledge of delivering the program there is mm. is listened to, they is reflected on, and we work together on deciding what the outcomes will be. Sky never tell us what to do. They're very much about sharing their aspirations and ask us as a partner how we can support them in delivering those. Sure, sure. We just had a question come in by Twitter, which is related to this. So maybe Judy, you want to pick this one up um, from at Ambika eighty nine on Twitter. Were there tough decisions or compromises you made to accommodate both interests, or did you become more and more aligned? That's interesting. Um, I think I, I haven't had the longevity on the program for the whole 12 years, and I'm sure there were some tough decisions at the start. But I think um, the key thing that, because we have these core aligned objectives to start with, 
the Sky's company ethos is believe in better and why does he want to unlock potential in young people and the Sky Academy evolved like that. If it hadn't evolved like that, we might have started parting company, but we've kept this common alignment. So I would say the tough decisions are usually just about, you know, how much can we actually get done in the time that we've got and, and being realistic about that. Sure. Alex. Yeah, I would just add. I think I think <coughs> that you know, with a bit more history, there's also there's been a bit of a coming together. So we feel very much, and I'm, I'm sure you reflect that that this has moved from a program somewhere within the greater organisation mm. Sky to something which feels much more part of, and I know is part of mm. the business strategy. This is kind of this isn't something we do as, as Sky does to to as you said earlier, you know, invest and feel good about. Mm. This is absolutely core and central to some of the, the ways in which the business is growing and developing, not least, you know, the, the engage with, with employees here sure. at, at Sky, I think mm. that's... So had you not seen that happening within Sky, had you been, would you be more reluctant to continue that relationship? I'm not sure, I'm not sure actually that we would be, have been more reluctant. I think what it has done, it, it has made sure that the, the relationship is cemented around a common purpose. It's, it's never, we've never felt that we're standing with a begging bowl, please Sky invest in this program. Yeah. It's, it's been embraced over time more holistically by both organisations. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that the athlete mentoring is now hardwired into the Youth Sport Trust. It's part of a whole broader range of programmes. Equally, while Sean, you know, heads up Ask Sky Sport Living for Sport programme, you could ask any member of staff in the organisation, they would absolutely know what it is, what it stands for and why, because it's it has become part of our DNA, this program. It's it's not just one of the things we do, it's a very central yeah. part. So that's crucial, it's about getting the rest of the business to buy into absolutely. these partnerships. Absolutely, and one of the key roles that I have is not only talking externally about the, the power of Sky Sports and Sport and Sky Academy, it's also about working with senior exec within Sky to, to, to ensure they understand the value of the partnership and they very much invest in it. Um, we have the full support of Sky Sports, Sky Sports News, Jeremy Darrick, our chief executive, mm. who comes and visits, does school visits, he comes along to events. They want to understand and they want to be involved, and I think that that's what gives it the momentum, mm. because it's evident to senior management as well that it's very, very mm. key to, to what we're doing. And you, you mentioned Jeremy Darrick. We, you know, one of the greater benefits of the Youth Sport Trust this partnership is that Jeremy was on our board for three and a half years, so the organisation benefits way beyond just this program, yeah. the, 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 not just the funding, but the wider assets that Sky bring to the Youth Sport Trust. I mean, they're helping Sean develop, he's being driven and um, is being more innovative as a, as a result of the interaction, but as an organisation, we've benefited hugely from the expertise. I think, um, back to the, the tough, it was there any tough decisions, the potentially, I think, if I, YST were a little concerned when we, we launched Sky Academy mm -hmm. and we said, right, Sky Sports and Sport is going to be part of a context of a suite of initiatives across sports, the arts and TV. And you kind of, with a little hesitation moment about what does that mean for, you know, we talked about it, mm -hmm. you know, does that mean it's going to change for us? Are we going to be less important, more important? In fact, they couldn't be more important because the true fact is we couldn't have launched Sky Academy without the learnings from Sky Sports Living for Sport, and that's one of the business benefits back to us. Sure. But I do think that if we hadn't got the clear and open communication and that we share frustrations and that they put, you know, people talk about it, then you get to a difficult situation where people and misunderstandings can create a bad feeling. Yeah. And I think we just, we, we, we hit it head on and said, this is actually going to be amazing. And you, you then, you know, we've all been great, haven't we? Yeah. Sure. And among the people that are tuning in today, I'm sure there are many on, on either sides of the kind of fence, on the NGO charity or corporate side, who are possibly looking for a partner right now to do something similar to what you guys have been doing these last 12 years. What what's advice, maybe Sean, you want to kick off, what's, what's your advice to, to a, an NGO or a charity looking for a corporate partner, first of all? Yeah, I think it, it's finding that right need for you both to come together. And I think we took our use, what we talked to the young people on this programme about. We talked to young people about finding something that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think if that would be my one piece of advice, it would be, don't necessarily just think about the business outcomes. Are you passionate about the piece of work you're wanting to do? Yeah. And I think that's been a bedrock of both Sky and the Youth Sport Trust in terms of everybody that's involved in this programme is passionate about what the outcomes are. So that would be my advice. Sure. Uh, yeah, I I suspect for, from an NGO perspective, if there are NGOs listening, it's keeping your mind open yeah. to the ways in which you might benefit 
from a relationship with a corporate. So the immediate thought of an, any NGO with cash is, you know, yeah, they're funding yeah. to support our work. And of course, you know, that is hugely important. Mm. But as I sort of touched on already, the benefits to us as an NGO have been huge of partnering. You know, the, everything from the expertise that we've been able to benefit from the team, talked about Jeremy Derrick's involvement in, in the board, the the power of the association of the two brands. So our brand is credible in schools, but my goodness, is the Sky brand pred- credible with young people and its ability to reach and connect with young people, which is, a, which is tough, um, is huge. So it, it's it's not going in with too too much agreed in your own mind. It's listening to that corporate partner, finding out what's important to their business, and then trying to work together to mould something that is genuinely owned from day one by both parties and has value for both parties. Yeah, sure. And Judy, similarly, looking for a, the right charity or the right NGO to, to work with? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, it would come if you take on board the fact that it's got to be the right piece of work and your organisation share the, the same core values, I think from a corporate perspective, you've got to understand the difference between sponsorship and partnership. Right. Because sponsorship is going, here is, a, here is X pounds, and we might put our badge on something, mm-hmm. and a partnership, which we very much at Sky like to get involved in. In fact, we're almost so hands-on that you've got to be the right partner to work with us, really. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, across arts, we've got, we've, we work with WWF, we work with British Cycling, we've worked with several big large art organisations, as well as Youth Sport Trust, and it's always about actually coming together and being able to work as a partnership rather than one side dictating to the other. And the corporate needs to be aware how much influence or how much involvement would you like. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is you recognise your strengths and weaknesses because Sky is very clear when it comes to the table exactly what it can offer, exactly what platforms it can do, how much it can amplify messaging, but it also does not have expertise in certain areas which it wants to partner with. So Mm -hmm. that's what we would that's what we would be advising them to look for and, and just make sure your goals are aligned. Sure. And Ali, um, you don't just work with, with Sky as a, mm-hmm. as a corporate partner. You have other corporate partners, do you? Yeah, we do. We have a number of corporate partnerships um, and over our 20-year period have had a, a bigger number than we, we're working with at the moment. But we're largely working with four core partners of which um, Sky is the biggest partner. But what we've learned over time is, is the relationships that we have now are very deep so they are relationships that are very similar to the Sky One in the way in which they've been conceived and the way in which they've grown. And we don't have any direct sponsorship mm-hmm. arrangements. And part of that's clearly we work in the school's environment and that would be a very challenging place to try to position anything where there's a direct return on investment around sales. Um, but all of our relationships are, are slightly different. But they, they, for any NGO listening, it is that, that very good point that you just made about the difference between sports sponsorship and partnership, partnership arrangements take a lot more effort probably yeah, I would say so, and, yeah. and they require you know, a, a much greater degree of interface but the long term benefits and the depth of the impact is far greater. Yeah. Okay, before we go into our sort of final 10 minutes of our, of our chat, I uh, just want to remind uh, those of you tuning in to send us some questions to, to Judy, to Ali, to, to Sean. Uh, use the hashtag on Twitter, Sky Partnership. Uh, use the Q&A box on the platform, um, and we'll try to get to your questions. Um, so back to you, Judy. I mean, presumably, you know, maintaining these partnerships is not all plain sailing, and I wonder what the, you know, the most difficult thing is in, in actually keeping a relationship alive. Yeah, what are the sort of big challenges, really? Okay. Um, if I look at it from a corporate perspective... I would say that the sky pace, the pace at which we work in this organisation is hugely challenging. We're a fast-paced environment. We're always looking ahead. We're always looking at what's next. And that can be challenging to to, uh, a charity partner. However, I don't feel that it's not something that, you know, particularly with YST that they haven't met. And it can also move things forward. But it's obviously a challenge that's there. And, you know, we've proved we don't meddle with the core program. It's a great, great product, but actually the pace at which we've de- desired innovation perhaps has been a, a, a challenge sometimes because we're, we're quite ambitious. Um, I think another thing that we, we've actually reflected on um, is how many team changes you get across 12 years um, <laughs> and no one person has been, has been carrying this forward and one of the key challenges has been making sure there's continuity and that's why 
I think that the success of this partnership has been that we have networks at every single level. My team are very much on the ground operationally, talking every day with Sean and his team. Mm. Um, and you've got Jeremy, Derek, obviously, conversationally with Baroness Hugh Campbell, the chair. You've got a lot of networks in between, and therefore, if somebody changes, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. Sure. There's just such a big network of us now that people, one person isn't indispensable. So that, that could have been a challenge, and that has happened, but we kind yeah. of were locked in, basically. It's f- funny, we just had a question come in on, on that. Uh, one uh, of our listeners has said, how important are individuals in partnerships? What happens if there's a change in, in personnel? Uh, Ali? I think individuals are important, and I'd have to say, you know, not just because I'm sitting between these two individuals, but individuals are important, and the, the quality of individual running the programme, but just as Judy said, that both the programme or the, the piece of work itself being hardwired into the organisation, so it's written into the strategy and it's written into the forward direction, really important, and then those t- transitions of staff are managed really carefully. Um, but the fact that we have got so many layers of interface, that the organisation is connected at so many different layers, it means we've never faced a position where everybody at all layers has gone at the same time. So no, there's no. always been a continuous I mean, that's the product of how long we've been in partnership. So obviously I think it could be more challenging if you're in a shorter-term relationship mm-hmm. and you just have to make sure that you start with a very clear direction that you have probably senior-level network contacts, which are less frequent changes, rather than just the day-to-day operation being where things are centred. So we have strategic reviews quarterly with a lot more people around the table than just run the day-to-day delivery, in addition to the weekly operational meetings that would happen on a day-to-day basis about delivering the team. And that's one way that people who are not directly uh, connected with delivering still have a wider understanding of what the partnership is doing at that one point in time. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Tom, can I just also add to that that one of the things I think we do really well as both organisations if we do talk about that real ground level and the programme delivery, Mm -hmm. when we bring new people in as quickly as possible, we try and make sure they see the outcomes of the work they're doing. So we try and get them very quickly to understand exactly what the focus is, what we're delivering on the ground, what the athlete mentors do. So they get a real passion for that programme really quickly. They're not just brought in to do a role. They're immediately immersed in what the outcomes of that are and can feel that and sort of live that so that they're much more, again, I use the word passion, but passionate about what they're doing on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. And Ali, the, the, this notion of uh, you know the sheer pace of, of mm-hmm. change and movement within Sky, is it a challenge for you to keep up with? And, and if so, how do you keep up with it? I have to nod, because you're nodding away. <laughs> <the same thing>. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it is a challenge. Of course it's a challenge. You come back to your other point, is we have more than one corporate partnership. So it's a challenge for us to manage the integrity of each relationship and ensure that we, we are up to speed with everybody. But at the same time, I do have to say, it's one of the um, great assets for us because the pace at Sky keeps us on our toes. It means this program has evolved continually and therefore it's stayed relevant. And yeah. I think that's one of the key reasons why 12 years on, it's still going. So it is a challenge, but it's a challenge that we're, we're up for. Uh, we know it's important, but we try our very best to, to keep pace with it. I mean, one example of that is when we had to take the baseline measures of the KPIs wider than just Sky Sports and for Sport because we were measuring it across the whole of Sky Academy. And that challenge and that pace of, of that launch was talking about getting YST to come with us and be really aware of how we could actually make that move from perhaps number of schools to number of participants. And we had to change processes. We had to change methods. And you, you really jumped on board and got got behind it. And we, could, we couldn't... This is where I was talking about the learnings from Sky Sports and Sport are just the bedrock and foundation of what Sky's gone on to do, which is a massive, massive yeah. win for us. And I think coming back to the courageous conversations and mm. the point that um, Judy made about looking to us for expertise, actually, if there are unrealistic demands, mm. we'll say so. Yes. And the respect is there that if you're saying this isn't realistic, you sport trust, then we kind of accept that. No, nobody in this partnership wants to set either up to fail. We want to succeed, yeah. and our success comes no, from. Okay. Let's let's take another one of our our listener questions, which kind of takes us back to where we started this conversation. Uh, Rick Benfield asks, when identifying new partners, have you proactively approached organisations, and if so, how, or have they all been organic stroke lucky? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> to either. Um, I think what we're very conscious of as the Esport Trust is which organisations both have the underpinning value set that would um, make them a, a 
potential partner, but also have an interest in this area. So we said from the word go that the fact that Sky is interested in young people in sport meant that when those two individuals had that very first conversation, there was some common ground. So we we do make sure that our corporate partnerships team are on you know a, a very alive to what's happening in the corporate world and looking for potential. But I think it's it's also having an open mind not to assume that just because a particular corporate has had an interest in that area for some period of its history that it, it will do. In fact, again, our experience shows that sometimes corporates stay with a the theme and then they move to something very different. They've done something in a space and they now want to move into a different space. So it's keeping that open mind and being prepared to flex and bend and being creative enough to make sure that we can respond within reason, respond to whatever the business objectives are of that partner. And are there corporates that might approach that you wouldn't work with? Um, yes, there are. So we have to be very careful, given our work is with young people and with schools. So we've got to be really careful about brands that schools simply wouldn't tolerate. on like their a fast food company or a... Yeah. Yeah, it can be very, very difficult, confectionery companies. Um, anything, you know, tobacco companies, mm. that, that there are some obvious ones that we, we have a clear stage gate process mm. that, that we, we don't go near. But we do get, interestingly, quite a lot of direct approaches or approaches through agencies who work on behalf of corporate partners yeah. um, come across us. And that always makes us pleased because it kind of reflects that we're, we're a credible partner and we're someone that, you know, again, thanks to the partnerships that we do have, puts us in a very strong place sure. to be seen as a, a delivery partner of choice for others. Yeah. Judy, I wonder if I can ask you about accusations of of greenwash, perhaps, or or working with charities just because you you know it makes you feel good. How do you counter that? And obviously, I'm not saying this partnership is bad, but presumably there there might have been partnerships in the past that have, yeah. have brought this up. How do you how do you kind of deal with that? Well, I think first of all, um, if you're in a partnership that's delivering real social value that's measured, there's less likelihood of you being accused of that rather than just badging something. Mm. There are corporates who really do just want to have a name and association and pay for that privilege and then really nothing much comes out of it. And so therefore that's probably less authentic. Um, and if you come to rally the business to do some big project or to actually respond to certain things like that, they're really not behind you because nobody's really invested in it. So I think if you've got a partnership that's invested in, from a senior level uh, down, then that's less likely. I think the other thing is evidence. Everywhere across all of the partnerships that Sky have, we not only have to have evidence for ourselves, but we actually are happy to share our evidence of what we're achieving. So if you've looked at what you know the actual realities of the difference and impact and that we're making to young people's lives in this sense, or in arts about how many other people we've been able to expose new art forms to, or whether we've been investing in young talent to take them to the next stage of their careers, there is the evidence not only in stats but also in personal journeys that are, uh, that people are prepared to talk about mm -hmm. that really don't make it very. Uh, easy to just say that's not particularly authentic and I think if you stick with core values and a strong purpose it with your partners then if both sides are consistently saying the same things and the right things then I hope that would be a good way to, to counter that really. Sure, sure. Um, in the interest of time I think we're going to have to shortly wrap things up and I wonder whether I could ask each of you to maybe sum up with a a tweet-like sentence that kind of gives us and our audience um, a short piece of advice. So what is the answer to a successful corporate NGO partnership? Who wants to go first? I'm going to go first because it will be harder to follow anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say find common ground. Um, have those difficult conversations when needed, um, but value your respective expertise. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. I, I think I'm going to come back to something that's a theme for me working with Sky about the people that I've worked with for the last five years and that I certainly work with at the Youth Sport Trust and that is make sure you find something that you're passionate about. Yeah, comes back to passion. Judy? I would say in the practical sense of some of the questions that have come in that said, you know, what happens if, what happens if, please accept that things go wrong. Things don't always go. This didn't start out as a 12-year program. It, 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 you can have much less ambitious targets and still get things right if you communicate and if you have the right people in place and as I think as Ali said you've got to be prepared to have tough conversations which is quite good because there's two Yorkshire people in the world so <laughs> that really helps. <laughs> <laughs> well I mean given le the level of interest we've had in this subject uh, across two degrees and the number of people that are tuning in and have signed up for, for this 
session there's clearly a subject that you know poses plenty of questions and and challenges and i guess like any relationship you know both parties need to to work at things uh, and as we've heard today there's a range of tools and techniques to, to really sort of keeping that magic alive as it were and i think that the sky youth sport trust partnership proves that Partnerships can have longevity, uh, but it's got to make sense and it has to have purpose for, for both parties. And it must drive value, uh, however that value happens to be defined by, by different organisations. Uh, Judy, Ali, Sean, thank you for sharing your insights and giving us a, a frank account of how your relationship works. It's been very useful and you've given us plenty to take away today, so thank you very much indeed. And to our audience, thank you for your questions and thanks for tuning in. A recording of this session will be made available and, and, and sent to you in due course, so please do share it with colleagues and peers as you see fit. Uh, but thanks for being with us today, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>